Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post commentary on the missions that are conducted during the live streams on February 28th and March 6th. On February 28th I did some other things later in the stream that weren't related to Solar System Colonization, so most of the material in this video is from March 6th. The mission that I conducted on February 28th was just another Jupiter probe. We already have two on the way, but I just wanted to send one more out as backup since we were at the right transfer window. So this is the probe. It's it's basically identical to the Jupiter Probe Beta, which is the one I launched in the previous episode. So I just wanted this back up just in case something happened to the, the first one we launched. It is launching on an SLS Block 2 with Perios boosters. The Block 2 could have SRBs, but as I've said before, uh, I'm not entirely sure on the numbers on those. So the Perios boosters seem to have more consistent numbers. Of course, this is all overkill for a Jupiter mission. We could launch a Jupiter mission with less than this. As we have ignition and launch. Uh, if we could figure out the flybys. I do have the flyby finder for for real solar system. But I haven't played around with it yet. So that's the thing that could cut down on the time and the size of the rocket we need to use. Also, if our probes were smaller, I mean, the probe core itself tends to be fairly large, and uh, there are various other ways that we could reduce the size of the probe itself so that we could also reduce the launcher. But uh, maybe I'll get into that with the Pluto mission, which we will have later in this video. Alright, here we go. Uh, all the visuals looking very good. The Perios boosters have separated. Nice view of Florida. The second stage on this SLS Block 2 is a J2X rather than the usual RL10C1s. And the reason I did that, of course, is because of burn time. I didn't have the patience to sit through the RL10C1s going through their long burn. But, of course, it's supposed to be those. The J2X is less efficient than the RL10s, but it could have a higher lift capacity simply because it can get the payload to orbit quicker. Alright, here we go. Engine shutdown. Okay, main stage is off, and here's the J2X. And I attempt fairing separation, and it sort of works. That was with all of the numbers maxed out on the fairing, the separation force and the torque. As with the previous Jupiter probe, the first interplanetary stage is three Vinci engines burning hydrogen and oxygen and then the next stage is methane and oxygen that's a CC methane common extensible cryogenic engine and we're pretty close to orbit here engine shut down on the J2X and of course I chose methane and oxygen to minimize boil off and hopefully that stage will help us to get into orbit around some moon of Jupiter here's me plotting the approach to Jupiter and of course we want to be in the plane of the moons in order to get the opportunity to hit one of them. There we go. That involves quite a large normal burn, but that's alright. Because it's still much smaller than the prograde burn, it doesn't add too much to the total delta V that we need. Okay, ignition on the J2X, re-ignition, using its last remaining ignition there. And also taking advantage of it in order to turn towards our maneuver node, because otherwise I was having a little bit of trouble there. Here we have the three Vinci engines doing the next stage of the interplanetary transfer. And it looks like they have enough juice to take care of that. Actually, uh, at this point, it looks like we deviated too far away from prograde, so they didn't have enough juice and we had to use a little bit of the methane burning engine. So, separation. And everything is set. Ignition. And there we go. I should mention that the instruments on the probe are useful. This is not a trivial probe. The instruments are to scan for ore and water and other resources. And that will allow us to refuel around Jupiter, which is essential. And so we do want to get into orbit around a moon that has those resources. And that is the main goal. Of course, with the inclination that we ended up with there, that's not good enough. So I created a temporary mid-course plane change. I decided that I would plot out exactly what would happen later, but I wanted uh, a temporary mid-course plane change to fix that inclination. Anyway, here I'm building a tug. 
The goal of the tug is to bring the Mars cycler test closer to the station so that crew can transfer from the station to the cycler to test its life support systems. Uh, the problem with the Mars cycler was that one of the tank that was supposed to feed its own thrusters wasn't pressurized so the thrusters aren't working. And here you can see I decided to launch it with a second stage that has a Merlin 1D engine and the first stage is a 5 segment SRB. So this is the 5 segment version of the Space Shuttle SRB. This is the same SRB that would have been used on Ares 1 and will be used on SLS. I've named the tug George. I'm not entirely sure why, it just popped up into my head. So here we go, hopefully this is a quick launch of course with a SRB first stage. At least it should be cheap, I mean, I guess one of these SRBs is cheaper than a Falcon 9 first stage. Basically this is replacing the Falcon 9 first stage with an SRB. It probably has less payload capacity thanks to that, but that's made up for the fact that we have that Vinci engine third stage. The Vinci engine third stage will uh, finish it off and its high efficiency makes up for the low efficiency of the SRB. Okay, here we go, boosting out of Florida. I would really like to know exactly how much these 5 segment SRBs cost and whether they really would be cheaper than the Falcon 9 first stage. In that case, they would be a really good payload rocket. I wouldn't trust crew on it, but... Uh, they would be a really good small payload rocket. Okay, separation and ignition of the second stage. Of course, the spatial SRBs, or the five segment versions, I don't know what else to call them. Anyway, uh, they don't completely burn out before you have to separate them. There goes the fairing, and I decided to use the stock fairing because, well, it separates. Sort of an important feature of the fairing. Uh, so, for some reason, the stock fairings don't have a problem with separating even if the procedural fairings do. That's an interesting fact. And as to, I guess, the problem with 64-bit has something to do with the procedural fairing plug-in, rather than anything intrinsic about the coupling. Okay, separation of the Merlin 1D stage, and now the third stage, which is uh, Vinci engine. And this will get the tug to orbit. And actually, it'll help with the whole rendezvous process with the Mars Cycler because this engine has multiple ignitions and we do seem to have some Delta V left over after it brings the payload to orbit. There we go. Alright, all set. And this is the first of the rendezvous burns. This one to correct our inclination which was quite a bit off. That was either due to the timing of it or probably because the SRB was a little bit difficult to control. It does have gimbling. Anyway, here we are trying to match speeds with the cycler, and I didn't do it quite in time. So we had to continue on for a bit to catch up to it. And now I extend the RCS booms on the tug, which are helpful to make sure the tug can maneuver with the heavy payload in front, which may or may not have RCS of its own. And then separation. Now with all that RCS and with 5,993 meters per second of delta V, I wasn't too worried about docking with the Mars Cycler. It was more a matter of actually bringing it to the station that was the question. But here's Cycler again with its solar panels. For some reason the solar panels like to spontaneously retract. Um, it's some sort of glitch. And so every time I visit the Cycler again I have to extend them. Same thing happens with the station. I'm not entirely sure why that happens. Anyway, here's the docking, and you can see the inflated habitat, all ready to go and receive some Kerbals. The reason that we're bringing the Kerbals from the station over to this is because the life support on the station will be diminished and there's plenty more life support here, so it's better to just transfer them over here rather than resupply the station. We'll have to resupply the station pretty soon anyway. I gotta check up on the shuttle soon too. Anyway, here we go, all docked, and now we can proceed to the station. With the cycler present, you can see that we only have about 860 or so meters per second of delta V. The structural mass of the tug is of course very light. With a tug, that's what you want. You don't want a very heavy structural mass for the tug. But 800 is plenty enough to make a rendezvous with anything in low Earth orbit as long as you're in the right inclination. And we were pretty much in the right inclination. So, 
everything is good, except for the lag. Of course, approaching Skynest Station, there's a lot of lag, and rather than attempt to dock with all the lag involved, I decided to just park it and then have the Kerbal's EVA out to it. Seemed like a simpler way of doing it rather than to do a very long involved docking procedure. Now you'll notice the blueness, which is currently Earth. And the reason why it gets blue like that is if you try and uh, jump to something in space without first launching something off of the ground, it just does that. I don't know why. It's either Scatter or RSS Visual Enhancements. One of the two uh, messes up and decides to turn the whole thing blue. Uh, so generally I launch something and then do all the space operations. If you then go back to the Space Center for any reason, you have to launch something again, otherwise if you use the tracking station and jump to a craft, you once again get the pale blue dot, as, uh, as it very obviously is. But anyway, uh, third Kerbal heading out to the Cycler, and then we should be all done. We will of course move the Cycler well away from the station so that nothing weird ever happens. So here we go, Kerbal. And that leaves only one Kerbal at the station, by the way. Only Pijeeper, the Kerbal, is currently on the Moon Chaser. And here we're doing the burn to move the Cycler away from, from the station. We'll eventually transfer some more crew by Pijeeper's request. Pijeeper is a recruited Kerbal from the stream. So yeah, we'll have two more crew members go up there. This is a Pluto probe. And... Chat wanted me to make it pink, so I made it pink. Uh, I had a pink texture. A texture. I have uh, solid color textures just in case. I added those in myself. So pink texture it was, and now it's sort of like a, sort of like Russian nesting dolls with the stages. <laughs> Basically, small stage, slightly larger stage, slightly larger stage, and then another stage. And of course, we'll all put it all on top of an SLS block too. Again, I'm not using flyby. Finder in order to get to Pluto. It is Pluto direct, so going straight to Pluto without any flybys. And we're just using a series of stages on top of the block two. You'll notice that I gave this probe the very obvious name of Pinky, and the goal is to get it into orbit around Pluto so it can do some scanning as with the Jupiter probes. But uh, considering the last time I tried to send a Pluto probe out, we didn't quite make it at all, not even a flyby. Uh, I, I wasn't, I was sort of hedging my bets with chat. I was saying, well, well, we'll get into orbit if we can, basically. Now right now I have all of the upper stages locked, so that's why you're not seeing any Delta V. Oh, so there's staging problems, so that's also complicating matters. We'll have some huge fairings, it looks like. I could have probably done something to reduce the size of the fairings, but anyway, here we are. SLS Block 2, we are in line with the Moon and the Ecliptic, or close to the Ecliptic, and off we go. You'll see down below only the Delta V of the launcher is being red, we're not seeing the Delta V from the upper stages. Of course I have sped up the video in order to match it with real time. But the gap between real time and sim time was not too big, it was like between 3 and 4. So manageable, I guess you could say. So if you assume 10 minutes to orbit, you're talking about a half hour launch. Not great, but could be worse. Okay, here we go for booster separation. There you go. Well, it's a reliable system, and it's a hefty system, but now it's got some shakes for some reason. I think I was probably hitting some sort of 64-bit issue, who knows. Or the 64-bit equivalent of the RAM limit, something like that. Anyway, it was jittering about, and here we have core stage running out. Main engine cutout and separation. And once again here we have the J2X in place of the four RL10C1s. Bearing separation just barely got off. Just barely avoided some catastrophe there. 
Now the J2X was a possible configuration for the uh, SLS Block 2 and maybe the company that makes the J2X will continue to lobby for its usage, but uh, right now it's just going to be the RL10C1s. I guess those engines were cheaper or something. Okay, here we go. We are reaching orbit. There we go. Engine shutdown. And payload separation. Now we did have about 300 meters per second or so left in the J2X stage and it did have another ignition I believe. But for some reason I did decide not to use it. I think it was because it, that stage didn't have RCS thrusters to turn it to the maneuver node. Anyway, we have 20,000 meters per second. Now you might have been able to see that I had a Pluto plot ready, but there was a problem with that plot and I'll discuss that in a bit. But in order to clear my head and figure out what to do about the problem, I decided to try and launch the Burroughs rover again. We had some problems with it because of the center mass and the center of thrust not lining up. So uh, here I went again. And this is the Ares Prime with four Space Shuttle main engines on the first stage and then a J2X on the second stage. Getting a lot of mileage out of those J2Xs. And this was meant to be a quick launch vehicle. Sort of a SLS alternative that would be quicker to get to orbit. Uh, in real time, I mean, so less lag. In reality, I, I don't know if it actually produces less lag. At least on this launch, it uh, actually had a four times four x gap between real time and sim time. So for every four seconds, it was one second sim time, and that's worse than the SLS Block Two. So I don't know why that was. Maybe it was because I I, was, I had just been streaming for a very long time and my computer was a little bit tired. Anyway, at least the rocket performed fine. That's, that's the least we can hope for, I suppose. And here we go, almost at the end of the first stage here. There we go, main engine cutout, separation, second stage, ignition. So I have a little confession to make at this point, because I totally forgot about this Burroughs rover. After I did this launch, I figured out what I would do with the Pluto probe, and how I would get it to Pluto and solve my problem, which I still haven't explained yet. Uh, but I just left the Burroughs rover in orbit around Earth with solar panels out so that it was ready to go. But then in the next week, uh, on uh, March, March 13th, I did something completely different. I moved on to do other things and forgot about the Burroughs rover. So yeah, it's still hanging out around Earth. And here we have made orbit and fairing separation is a little bit messed up but it didn't hurt anything on the rover so it it might it might still be ready to go but possibly because of all the stuff i did on march 13th the hydrogen and oxygen on the vinci stage that was supposed to transfer it over to the moon to test the rover might not be around anymore it might have boiled off anyway well that's uh, that might be a shame there but here is the Pluto probe, and you'll note that we're going in a very odd direction. The reason why we're about to burn in a, in a northerly direction here instead of at prograde is because I need to do, burn a lot of the fuel right at Earth. And so I need to do some of the inclination, uh, not really changing the inclination with respect to Pluto, but actually sort of pushing our uh, ascending or descending node at the orbit of Pluto. Since we're not at the ascending or descending node, we can't actually change the inclination with respect to Pluto. But I can sort of push the node towards Pluto. And the reason I need to burn so much at Earth is because I've got two hydrolock stages. So I need to expend the hydrolock stages before getting into interplanetary space, or the hydrogen is just going to boil off and we'll lose delta V. So we want to take advantage of as much delta V as possible, hence the trajectory. Then I hit another snag. I still had the, sec the next stage tank, the one with the single Vinci, locked when I activated the engine. And when I unlocked the fuel, I found that I couldn't start the engine. So I restarted the game. That was what uh, viewers suggested I do. And once I hopped back to the craft, the engine was already on. I had the throttle still up on my control stick, so it was automatically on. The problem was that the maneuver wasn't right. It had the original plot instead of T2 
taking into account what we had already burned. So I had to replot things. And I managed to figure out how to hit Pluto again. So there we go. The weird approach as it were. So again, the reason why the initial plot wouldn't have worked is because we were only burning part of it at Earth and then we needed to burn like 7,000 at the mid-course plane change. The problem is we wouldn't have that 7,000. It would have boiled off by then. Okay, that is the conclusion of that Vinci stage. And so the next stage is a hypergolic st storable stage uh, using Gemini lander engines. And again, I should explain, since I used the uh, advanced Gemini lander engines from the facet pack a lot, that they weren't actually used. Gemini didn't have any landing engines. Uh, they were hypothetical engines, but their stats are reasonable. 311 seconds of ISP using Erezine and N204. And uh, the good thing is that they throttle. They're very similar to, say, the, the Lunar Module Descent engine, except they're smaller. Okay. There we go. So that maneuver is done. And now we have the mid-course plane change. And we've still got the tank on the probe itself locked. You can see that the mid-course plane change looks like it's going to take 4,000 meters per second. And we've got 2,387 in this current tank. And then once we unlock the probe's own tank, we've got 5,385. So we've got enough to do the mid-course correction. And hopefully... Maybe, maybe enough to get into orbit around Pluto, but at least we can do the flyby bit. But that's not really what we want to do in colonization because we want to scan the surface for resources. Anyway, as a final thing, because there were a lot of viewers hanging out, I decided to do a balut test. Because I had never tested these balutes in real solar system before. And I wanted to see whether the balutes actually worked with realism overhaul and everything. So I created a quick launcher with a service propulsion system engine that's from Apollo. So that's the service module engine from Apollo. And a lower stage with three Merlin 1D uh, surface engines. The regular engines, not the vacuum engines. And so a fairly light rocket, one third of a Falcon 9 if you will. And so stubby. That's mainly because of the size of the... I was initially got put a different engine on the core stage. Actually, we could have probably made it a straight rocket because the Merlin 1Ds don't take that much space. The initial engines I put down there were a little bit uh, wider. This launcher goes real fast. It's only 2.5 real, real life seconds to one sim second, and of course, it's a lot lighter than the other rockets we've launched. So if you ever wondered whether Falcon 3 could be a thing, well, Falcon 3 can be a thing. Uh, not too hard, actually. Here we're waiting for first stage cutout. There we go, first stage is out. Separation. And ignition of the service propulsion system. Okay, looking good. Can we separate the fairings, maybe? These are the stock fairings. There we go. Wow, they went off with a lot of gusto. Now, the service propulsion system, for some reason, was not gimbling, so I had to turn on the RCS on the payload in order to maintain control. And here we go. Uh, just doing a descent test with this volute. So, it's just... The volute's there, we've got parachutes, we've got heat shield, and that's basically it. We've got sort of a tank full of fuel, that's just sort of a dummy payload. Here the periapsis is fairly mild, it's only 76 kilometers, and we're going to be skimming through the atmosphere. It's not a very harsh re-entry, but it's certainly harsher than what we would expect to happen on Mars which is why I'm really testing the blute for. But here we see that decoupler right there is overheating for some reason. The one between the heat shield and the tank. And I don't know why. It seems like an odd thing to overheat. It seems to be absorbing some heat from the heat shield, which it really shouldn't do. I've seen fuel tanks do that, but not a decoupler. I thought putting a decoupler there would make it safer. 
Instead, it turns out that the coupler exploded, heat shield slammed back into the payload, the RCS tried to control the whole thing, but that was not good enough. You can see uh, things are getting hot periodically. Just every little tilt makes the Blute want to go. It's really not the Blute's fault that we had this problem. So we simply couldn't test whether the Blute really did anything useful or not in real solar system. Anyway, so that's how I ended the stream on March 6th. Incidentally, we do have a Blute on a probe that's already been sent out to Mars, so we'll see how it does over on Mars. No idea there just yet. But uh, yeah, on that note, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.